Does anyone else get nervous when another politician heads towards the mic holding their coffee? Um, how many of you have ever had that where you had a whole series of things you wanted to say in your head and there's just one thing it's bouncing around so much that you've got to share it because you're just dealing in this sort of semi-surreal circle of trying to process what actually just happened? Okay, how many of you watched the speech last night? Okay, how many of you, as you were going back home, got home, turned on the television, and all of a sudden, Van Jones's face was looking at you? <laughs> and he was saying something nice. Seriously. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just so excited by this. Um, I, I saw Van Jones look into the camera and say, tonight, Donald Trump became the American president. And you're going, oh, God the left must be in absolute hysteria and panic at this moment. <laughs> and that was actually fascinating. It's not actually what I'm here to talk about, but, it, but it's worthy of a little observation. Think the vilification, the, 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 the craziness, the, 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 the just the hyperbolic language you've heard coming from the left over the last month. Some of the, uh, we sat down with almost 40 individual groups in Arizona last week. And people were, I had one older woman who said, I'm a moderate Democrat, and she's crying. You know, Donald Trump is going to come and take all my liberties away and this and that away. And I'm looking at her going, wow, you're sitting talking to me. I'm to the right of Donald Trump on most <laughs> economic issues. I mean, uh, it's, you realize, you know, he, in many things, he would score as fairly moderate, I mean, and a populist. And, and it's just, and, and when I talked to her, it was heartbreaking how much of the information she thought she knew was completely made up. And it's also something we sh uh, should talk about, particularly as the Leadership Institute, of how we help our brothers and sisters on the left have actually a flow of information that actually has some basis in truth and maybe a minimal amount of toxicity. So can I, one of the things I wanted to do this evening, is, or excuse me, this morning, is walk a little bit different than you typically hear from elected officials and other that get near this microphone. I want to tell you that, oh, that's the trash, wow. Uh, I want to share with you that I think we're in the middle of a revolution that actually is incredibly wonderful for those of us who are true sort of classical, libertarian-leaning, free market-loving Westerners, but for everyone else in the country. And it's not necessarily Donald Trump in the White House. It's this supercomputer you're carrying in your pocket. Let's walk through a couple ideas and see if you embrace it, because one of my fixations is bureaucracies don't make us freer. Bureaucracies don't make us healthier. Bureaucracies don't, don't make us more economically prosperous. Bureaucracies crush us. Bureaucracies crush the human spirit. But yet we still, as a society, as a government, we regulate as if it's still 1938. So let me come to you for a moment and just pitch you an idea. Um, I'm from Maricopa County, Arizona, probably the fourth most populous county in the United States. Phoenix, Scottsdale, incredibly wonderful. I can't believe you all choose to live here and not there. <laughs> Have any of you ever been to Scottsdale in the winter? I mean, seriously, why would you be here? Um, I do it because it's my job. But it, we're what's often referred to as a non-attainment county. We go in and out where certain air quality standards, if we break the caps, the EPA comes in and threatens saying, we're going to stop you from being able to offer building permits. We're going to stop businesses from expanding. We're going to make you do this, 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 this. And a lot of what, what, what the EPA and our air quality governance requires is crazy. But it's what tools they think they have in a bureaucratic model. You want to open up a business. You fill out paper, and you fill out more paper, and then fill out more paper for different regulators. You file the paper, and depending on the category of the business you're in, sometimes quarterly, Annually, you fill out more paper and then hire engineers to come give you stamps on your paper and so that paper can go sit in a file cabinet at a regulator. Do file cabinets full of paper make the air quality in my community better? 
Of course not. It's basically documentation for the trial lawyers a couple years later when something screwed up to have a place as a depository to go, a repository, um, to go and collect things so they can sue you. I want to argue that it's time for a revolution in just that. And that's, this concept cascades all up and down our society and our economy. There are now sensors you can attach to these things, these supercomputers you carry in your pocket that will do ozone and volatile organics and hydrocarbons. If I had a couple thousand people in my community of four and a half million driving around and this sensor is taking samples every five minutes and I put it up on a GIS map, all of a sudden I have functionally at the end of the week hundreds of thousands of data samples. So think this through with me. Do I keep beating up an organization, a business that's following the rules, that has invested in the equipment that's required to filter the air? Or do I find the clowns that are painting cars in the back of the lot without a filter? Because right now they get away with it. They set off the fixed regional sensors and everyone gets punished. My argument, if we use technology, we can leave the good actors, the good businesses, the good players alone. No more filling up file cabinets full of paper. If they screw up, you catch them instantly. But you start finding the people that are violating sort of the common, the rules, and you catch them instantly. It's the use of data. It's the use of crowdsourcing data and saying, instead of a bureaucratic 1938 model of filling up file cabinets, why don't we use something that's instant? It would be tremendously freer. It would reward folks who play by the rules by leaving them alone. And if you have someone out there that's screwed up, you catch them immediately. It would cost a fraction of how we do it today. And it's interesting, the only folks I've come across who oppose the idea happen to be in the consulting business, the engineering business, or the file cabinet business. <laughs> but that's just a simple example because it's nice and easy to visualize saying, oh, wow, there's a data solution, a crowdsourced data solution that deals with a crushing bureaucracy that actually doesn't really work. I beg of you if you are true classical sort of free market, because the question of your young lady who asked you saying, describe the free market, I come from the world where the free market is actually information. The information for me to know my choices, my pricing, my optionality, and to use that information to make the choice of what I consider best for myself, my family, my business. Free markets are information. And that's the one thing we truly lack in a bureaucratic model of governance. So this idea of crowdsourcing data actually did not start on environmental. We actually proposed this as an idea four or five years ago on saying, do I really need the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and all these other financial regulators to operate in the way they do, where you fill up file cabinet, and file cabinet, and file cabinet, and you fill out this, and fill out this, and fill out this. How about just? information. Um, there's a gentleman in the back, we were having the conversation on something called blockchain, distributive ledger. If you're interested in where the future is at this second, the fact there's a revolution going on around us at this second, learn about, host a seminar on what blockchain is. It's a technology that's bulletproof. It's actually never been cracked. There's been some bad coding in parts of it, but it's never been cracked. And the concept, if I came to you tomorrow and said, hey, you want to sell your car. Right now, do you have to go stand in the, is it DMV out here, line, and transfer the title, and do this and do that? What if I came to you and said, you could hit a button? How about if you wanted to send money to your daughter that's in school, and you wanted it absolutely safe, and you wanted to do it with minimal fees? You could hit a button. How about if you wanted to sell your house? How about if you wanted to prove your identity? You hit a button.
How about if you wanted to document a chain of insurance? How about if you wanted to move an item of value, whether it be a security or bond, a stock, to someone else? You hit a button and it's bulletproof. It's absolutely safe. The concept is so efficient. The way we do things right now is about to go through a technology revolution. The efficiencies this will bring to our society and the crushing of the bureaucracy around us. Remember, I'm from the philosophy that bureaucracies crush the human spirit. If you actually look at studies, it's, it's tell you what creates poverty around the world. What are the two things that always come up? Corruption and bureaucracies and the lack of rule of law. And this is about to at least, I believe, take on two of those because it's hard to have corruption if you have information and visibility, and it's hard to have a bureaucracy if I can do my transactions, my move my information, identify who I am on this, and do it efficiently and inexpensively. So please, think that through. Now, how does an organization like the Leadership Institute also have a footprint in this revolution? I will make you the argument as these young people are trained not only in the philosophy, but in the campaign management, and, and that was my relationship with the Institute many years ago. We also need to sort of evangelize these efficiencies. Let, 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 simple example, and I'm going to make up some of the numbers not to hurt the um, guilty feelings. Um, I'm from a community called Scottsdale, one of the greatest communities in the world. Scottsdale over here has a $600,000 earth mover. They use it a few hours a week. Does that any, set anyone else's hair on fire? A $600,000 capital asset and it's only used a few hours a week. Why hasn't someone, particularly a young person who's freaky smart, built an app for me that we put every asset that's in every level of government, whether it be my little irrigation district or my federal government or my tribal or my county, my state and say, hey, here's our $600,000 earth mover. The city next to you, do you need to borrow it for a few hours because we're only using it four hours. These things are run, designed to run 22 hours a day. It's crazy for another municipality, another level of government to go buy another $600,000 earth mover. Let's actually start sharing these assets. And these assets are everything from a building, a classroom. Uh, why isn't the elementary school gymnasium at 3.30 when the kids are out of school, why isn't it the community college? And then at 8.30, why isn't it the AA meeting? The smart engineers over here that work for my transportation authority, when they have finished a big project, and it's six weeks before the next project comes in, why isn't that downtime, lease, sold, trade, bartered, with another level of government saying, hey, you guys need some flood control engineers for this little municipal project, this irrigation project. The reality of it is the efficiency we can bring to the bureaucracy by an app would be a revolution. We need to embrace the disruption that this technology can bring to a revolution in government. You know, we talk all the time about how we want smaller, more efficient, less intrusive government. But then, you know what we do about it? Is we keep talking about it. I'm going to argue the solution's in your pocket. Let's promote it. And it's been fascinating. Even folks on our own side look at you with a sense of panic, often realizing, saying, David, I love the idea, but you're going to put me out of business. I need to stand in your way. We, as free market conservatives, need to be true to the cause, understand we have a path that's brought to us by technology, and then as often gets me in trouble, you lay out the path and you run over everyone in the way to do what's good for our community and our society. So hey, thank you let, for letting me behind the microphone. I think we wanted to do a couple questions. Yes, yes, well thank you. Okay, uh, the Congressman's ready to please.
speeches, uh, wait until you get the microphone in your hand before you uh, ask your question. Who will be first? Question here, yes. Thanks, and thank you, Congressman. Um, love the idea. We pitched some of this in regards to uh, uh, combining the use of school buses and city municipal buses in a local area because the, the three o'clock rush for after school was very different from the five o'clock rush from after work. And what, what you started seeing was the simple fact that especially when you had red and blue mayors in side-by-side -side cities, there was turf war, there were, were fiefdoms that, that you dare not cross in establishing these efficiencies. And even, even doing something like term limits doesn't end the grease on the pig, it just makes the, them have to grease it up faster to move it through faster. So I ask, what can be done when you've got you know, all these municipalities that would have to work together, federal agencies what, that would have to work together, what can be done to break down those fiefdoms, especially across party lines, to bring that efficiency to bear? Brilliant question. My answer is blunt instruments. <laughs> Look, um, I, I, we have a family philosophy. It's been around for a very long time, but it became an incredible truism after getting elected to Congress. Money, power, vanity run everything. But in Congress, my political experience, it's mostly about the money. Um, and I can give you um, a 30-second experience that's actually taking place in my state. Now, I'm blessed. I have a creative governor that's become a very good friend who's actually embracing this sort of chaos. But to show you there's solutions, I'll make you an argument, even the yellow bus, white bus, you may be already still thinking last century. Um, in Arizona, the majority of babies are actually born in our Medicaid system. We have a problem. A lot of our um, prenatal moms aren't showing up for their prenatal medical visits. When we surveyed them, you know, the number one thing we get is, well, waiting for the bus is hard. Dial a ride makes me wait for four hours. So you know what the solution was in the last few years? is we're going to build a bigger dial a ride system that costs a fortune. You know, especially little buses that come and pick you up if you wait for a four-hour window. And then someone pointed out this thing called, hey, you know, we have these buttons on these things, and it's called ride sharing. And whether it be Lyft or Uber or something else, and they'll do it for a fraction, a fraction, a fraction of the cost. So why not? Goodwill Industries spends a fortune training people, job training, but they don't show up, so many don't show up for their actual interviews because of transportation. It's now a button on the phone, ride sharing. I need you to think almost revolutionary of. It, 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 there, there's technology solutions and transportation now, this is transportation. Other questions, other kinds? Thank you. Um, my old boss, or my current boss, but when my boss, Ron Paul, was in Congress, he often made the observation that the two areas where there's less innovation than in every other area are health care and education. Mm -hmm. Not coincidentally, those are also yeah. the two areas that are most heavily controlled by government. Um, I'm bringing that point to tie in the theme of your speech to a question, which is, do you think that the um, House Republican leadership um, repeal, and repeal Obamacare and replace it with Obamacare 2.0 is going to be the type of health care plan that will actually encourage innovation in the health care market, or will, will it leave our health care delivery uh, system stuck in a 20th century model? Terrific question. Um, we're actually running an entire team in our office right now to make sure optionality is woven into the law. But you've got to understand, it's, it's a real battle. Um, First thing, you, what are the two times in life you think you know everything? Do you all remember being 14 years old? And for a couple in here, do you ever remember the day after you got elected to Congress? There is this arrogance of often those of us here in Washington, D.C., that we are so smart that we know what technology is. The fact of the matter is tomorrow someone's going to invent something that creates a revolution. Um, 
there's actually a bunch of brilliant technology rolling out across the world right now where they can do diagnostics by holding something to your forehead. Does a poor person who may be on a Medicaid system, do, should, would it be more efficient to let them ha visit their medical provider through this or use diagnostics, this? And should the doctor always be in this community? Or what if the expert is, happens to be on another jurisdiction but isn't part of this jurisdiction's medical guild? We have to have an honest philosophical conversation and then put it into law that says, if I want portability of insurance, right? We all go, oh, yes, we want portability. We want cross, be able to buy insurance across state lines. How about portability of medical services? Should that be allowed to cross state lines? How about portability of technology? So our goal, when we're working very hard with a couple of the smart people in the Energy and Commerce Committee, to weave in language that says optionality is the basis of this concept, that if tomorrow there's a technology revolution, that it is part of our future of health care. Um, you will be stunned at what is already available today technology-wise for your health care that you never knew was out there. Um, and how do you drive, once again, our bureaucracies to embrace it? So, it, it, yes, you hit something, it's a fixation of ours. Go ahead, here. Well, Could I ask a question about overregulation? Um, uh, President, President Trump said last night that for every new regulation, uh, he wants two regulations to be retired or eliminated. And I wonder what uh, the difference is going to be between uh, President Trump and President Obama. Uh, I think there's a question of ideology and how the EPA was used. I know Lisa Jackson, when she was head of EPA, had a secret cell phone, but nobody knew it had a sep separate number, separate name. Uh, there are a lot of spooky stuff with EPA, and in some ways, the EPA was like the KGB. All right, in that same line, um, look, I know our president has said he wants repeal of two for one. I, I love that from a standpoint of understanding the motivation, the goal, but the math doesn't make sense to me. Um, I can come to you and say entire sets of regulations in a modern society when I have data and technology make no sense at all. And the EPA is an incredible center. And this is if you're on the right or the left. If I came to you right now and tell me, the EPA's base data sets for the air quality outside these windows is correct. And my leftists will go, of course it is, and say, show me. And they go, well, well, how would we show you? Because the EPA keeps the data secret. They keep it secret from leftist groups, right groups, just researchers, people that just want to do analysis and say, are we doing it the right way? Is there a better way? We actually don't know. And when I chaired the oversight committee, in science over the EPA, what I found out, remember our philosophy for, before, it's always about the money? Guess what? A lot of it was about the money. The number of people that sold the scrubbers, sold the technology, did the engineering on the air quality and other, other issues the EPA was regulating happened to all be former EPA employees. And you started to see this perverse circle of was it about the things that are, com are common, would it be air or water? That's part of the common. Were we treating them respectfully, correctly, or were we treating them as almost a cartel for a small group that had created a, a washing machine of making money, giving back to a particular party, making money, giving back to... So my argument is the revolution of the ability to use information and data is much more than one for two. It, 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 it's much broader. It's, I, I beg of you for a much more robust thinking uh, uh, approach to it. 
sorry, I know you've raised your hand multiple times. Aaron. Good morning. Thank Are you. Are you from Arizona? You're darn too. Where? Uh, down on the border. Got, uh, uh, Douglas or? No? That, yeah. Well, not Douglas, but near there. Yes, Cochise County. Oh, beautiful area. People have no idea. Um, you know, it's it's actually like 5,000 feet, gra beautiful grassland. Yes, that's why we say we're better than Scottsdale. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you're beautiful, but I have spring training and and, and yeah. restaurants and yeah, but it's hotter my, my, there. My 16-month-old little girl. I mean, <laughs> yeah, we, we we like to say our climate's better because we're a higher elevation, so we don't have the heat that folks have up north. But anyway, speaking to that though. Um, uh, you're talking about technology advancement. Um, something I've ever observed back home in Arizona that there are those who might have an agenda that is very resistant to technology and robotics, and especially in Arizona with regards to our agricultural industry, because we often hear, well, we have need of the migrants because who would pick our strawberries? Whereas globally, other countries have far surpassed us with regards to um, mechanizing agriculture. The example, and I'll stick with strawberries, the robotics that is being has been developed in more than a decade ago in Japan and other countries where you have um, machines that pick our strawberries, and they work 24-7. And the technology is so um, advanced that do they know how to send a little beam to the strawberry to find out if it's at the exact right point of ripeness for picking. And I'm curious to know from what you're observing why we aren't adapting these technologies more rapidly and how is the immigration lobby preventing it? It's a really interesting question. I, and I actually don't have a great answer. I've, I did not know about the strawberry. I've actually observed um, one that now can actually do um, head lettuce through the water jet, which we always thought there was no way to actually harvest that. Um, your winter lettuce crop comes from our state. You know, we have this place called Yuma, Arizona. It's amazing the agricultural output from this desert plateau. My theory, though, is as long as I have true open economics, um, the most efficient model ultimately wins. And so what are we doing that distorts? You know, are we engaging in distortion, distorting practices um, through government regulations, government policies, the way we regulate capital markets? Because um, eventually the most efficient technology should win. Unless, of course, people in my job screw it up. <laughs> Thank you. We have time for a couple of more questions. One in the back. But, uh... Thank you. Hi, Carl Golov. Another uh, Ron Paul reference. Ron Paul has often advocated competition in currencies. I think he's primarily referencing the constitutional currency of, for example, gold and silver coin, which historically the velocity at which those traveled through the economy was a perhaps a constraining factor, but with now, as you mentioned, apps like Apple Pay, what if Apple Pay were to use a private label gold monetary unit where an ounce of gold could literally sit in one space in the vault but be transacted thousands of times a second around the world? Uh, all of a sudden, we could have an honest constitutional monetary system again instead of a system of purely uh, political currency that we have now. Um, there's actually a handful of theorists in the monetary side that actually talk uh, and share the concept of the current cryptocurrencies may actually have accomplished that because I have an alternative mean of transfer of value. Now, what is fascinating, if you really want to embrace this concept of transfer of value, um, what happens when I need a really efficient transmission method? Um, it, 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 and this will make a circle to, to your sort of your question, your comment. If I swipe my debit card over here, so I'm the retailer, but I'm looking for the most efficient pricing uh, mechanism on the transfer cost of that value to clear over here at my institution to put into your uh, on back onto your phone or whatever it is. Remember how we just talked a little bit about uh, distributed ledger blockchain. Well, the fact of the matter is, it's incredibly inexpensive to run, incredibly safe, and 
you can you and I could create a transmission network saying, hey, it's we're going to call it um, bitcoins or we're going to call it little blue clowns or whatever. As long as we agree on the the transfer value, you could peg it to the secondary moment of a commodity. I'm actually on a personal. I actually love the concept of competing value in my society in my world, whether it be a gold whether it be silver, whether it be Bitcoin, whether it be a cryptocurrency, whether it be a fiat currency. Because choice and alternatives, I believe, create a stabilizing effect. But you've got to remember the other part of that. I also need it to move. I need it to be presented and cleared. And the technology now provides the opportunity that you and I could actually create a transmission method saying, every time I swipe this card, it's denominated as a gold value peg and cleared over here, great. You just now created a commodity-based transmission of value. So go, you, I almost need to take, uh, and I used to sit on Chairman um, Ron Paul's uh, monetary committee years ago, so I consider him a personal friend. And we had versions of this. We were the very first ones to have the conversations about what a cryptocurrency means in that concept. I think actually the debate we've had for the last 100 years is actually now a debate that actually may have partially a technology solution. If there's time, if there's a, a, a question, one further question. Well, You're the last, was there somebody over here who had no, no, you would add your hand, hand up earlier. Oh, you already had one, yeah. All right, all the way back. So good morning, I'm Mauricio. I'm an intern here at the Leadership Institute. So my question is, I'll change a little bit the topic. It's just because I read a book uh, by Barry Goldwater a few weeks ago, and I'd like to ask you about him. Did he influence you or inspired you to get into politics? Thank you. Um, I have the unique benefit of having grown up almost in the neighborhood of the Goldwater family. Uh, my parents had a relationship um, uh, with the Goldwaters, my mother with um, Peggy Goldwater. And, yeah, but it, it's, you, you often don't, um, until you're, you're a late adolescent and you start to actually realize the people down the street is a very important man. And that's why there's always cars parked outside the house and those things. But, but my answer may be a little bit different than the philosophy of, hey, do you remember when you were 14 years old and the, that summer you read Atlas Shrugged and it changed your life? For me, having someone like the Goldwaters uh, down the street in, in, in our lives made it that it didn't have to be this sort of scary hey, that's the you know, magical, powerful elite, and you have to always be on this side. It was someone you got to talk to. He was someone you saw like every couple of weeks. And it, it, it demystified what it was like to be someone who was out there battling for the philosophy, battling for my state, battling for the cause. Um, it, look, it's one of the things I think you do that's so incredibly powerful is when there's interns in our offices when there's um, uh, young people who work on Capitol Hill or work on our campaigns or, or work on us around us policy-wise, it goes from that's that world that sort of it's hard to know about to, oh, you know, that's a guy that also has a chocolate problem or, in my case, a coffee problem. It humanizes it. So, so my, my response to them was a little different, but it sort of makes the circle. One of the things the Leadership Institute has done, it's so powerful is through the training and the education, it removes that barrier of mystery and makes it so any one of us can be one of the revolutionaries to save this country. Thank you. Thank you for letting me behind the mic.